I realize this is your seventh lecture in the day, and uh, you're brave people, okay? And I'll, I'll try to take that into account in, in uh, getting you through uh, still a seventh lecture. And uh, many of you, I guess all of you, uh, heard just last hour a lecture on capital and interest by uh, Dr. Murphy. This is capital-based uh, macroeconomics, so a little more capital. But uh, I, I'll say it up front that if there were some parts of Dr. Murphy's talk that you didn't quite understand, I'll save you from it, okay? I'll save you. And we'll be able to press on with macro uh, with a little bit of graphical representation of, uh, of the capital structure. I need to know my audience here uh, because uh, some of this involves some very uh, fundamental, basic uh, graphical representations of, of uh, relationships that you would have seen uh, if you took a course in macro at a principal's level or even a good high school course in, uh, in uh, macroeconomics. So let me see a show of hands. How many have had at least one course in macroeconomics? Okay. Government Men accounting. Pardon? You mean government accounting system? Right? No, I didn't count. Okay. Quite a few. No, nobody upstairs, but uh, here. Uh, they just, they're shy. They don't raise their hand. What can I say? Uh, but at least down here, quite a, quite a number of people uh, have had uh, macro. Well, good. That makes my job uh, all the easier. Uh, Capital-based macro, by the way, is, is, is really a synonym for Austrian uh, macro. And I've found that sometimes it's easier to sell, not necessarily to this audience, but to others, by identifying the focus, uh, the structure of capital, rather than uh, relating it to the country of origin. Okay? although uh, I don't mind calling it Austrian economics to this group or, or really any other. There, there are synonyms. Um, I won't need to spend too much time on the preliminaries uh, because you've already heard about Ludwig von Mises from Dr. Reiko and uh, about Friedrich Hayek as well. Uh, but the, the theory that uh, I'm going to present today uh, has its origins in uh, Mises' earliest book, 1912, theory of money and credit, and it was developed in sort of an analytical direction, a little bit of graphical direction, uh, by uh, F.A. Hayek uh, in the 30s, uh, starting with his uh, venture at the London School of Economics. So that's where it comes from. It actually predates Keynes by uh, a good many years. And uh, at the time Keynes wrote, uh, Hayek and Keynes uh, were combatants in England, uh, Keynes at Cambridge and Hayek at uh, LSE. Uh, in fact, in a later lecture, I'll have uh, Keynes and Hayek head to head, and we'll get a we'll get a sort of a blow by blow account of uh, how that debate goes. So uh, this is where the the uh, theory comes from, and I want to take my uh, cue here from an article that appeared earlier this year in Forbes. Steve Hankey, some of you will recognize that name. You read his stuff. It's, it's, it's good stuff. He has a, a, a page in uh, virtually every issue of uh, Forbes. And he had one on uh, the Greenspan Fed. And he had a, a summary of the Austrian theory that was just so concise that, that I want to use it uh, here today. So here's what he says. With interest rates artificially low, Consumers reduce savings in favor of consumption. In other words, why save? You're not getting that much interest for your money. Consume instead. And entrepreneurs who increase their rate of investment spending, they increase the rate of investment spending. And then you have an uh, imbalance between saving and investment. And if you've taken macro, you know that somehow or other, saving and investment have to come into line with one another. Uh, but you get an imbalance here. You have an economy on an unsustainable growth path. He says this, in a nutshell, is the lesson of the Austrian critique of central banking developed in the 20s and 30s. Okay, that's, that's pretty uh, uh, straightforward. And I'll call to your attention three words in there that just jump out at you, artificially low interest, uh, imbalance between saving and investment, and unsustainable growth. And so the only thing else I need to get me started on this lecture is a methodological point made by uh, Hayek. And it's a point that uh, I think is virtually um, accepted just by stating it. Uh, and Hayek says, before we can even ask how things might go wrong, 
we must first explain how they could ever go right. And that, that sounds reasonable, doesn't it? It sounds reasonable. And yet, if you look at the competitors to the Austrian theory, you see that maxim flouted. You see Keynes, for instance, who didn't even ask how things could go right because he was pretty sure they couldn't. And, and you get Friedman, uh, who assumes things do go right as long as the central bank keeps the price level from changing. Uh, but Hayek makes a point of getting it straight what, how markets work uh, if they're not uh, influenced by perverse policy. And it comes across almost as a corollary of what happens uh, when the central bank intervenes. So I'll pull those three words out, uh, artificial as applied to the interest rate. Uh, we first want to know something about the natural rate of interest, which really means uh, one that's not policy infected. Okay, what if the natural interest rate uh, is, is telling the truth about people's decisions about saving and investment and so on? We have to look at that before we look at what happens if they're artificially low or uh, the imbalance between saving and investment. How, how does a balance between saving and investment come about? And uh, unsustainable growth, that, that's the Austrian boom that turns into a bust. Uh, what constitutes sustainable growth? And how does the market work for you and for me to, to get the economy to grow uh, in a sustainable uh, way? So I think what you'll see in this lecture is that even though it's billed as Austrian theory of the business cycle, and it certainly is, we'll get to it, that a lot of it is preliminary. In other words, a lot of it you have to show how markets would work if allowed to work. And once you've done that, then it's a pretty easy gig to go back and show how wrong things go if interest rates, for instance, are overridden by uh, public policy. So. I set out first uh, several basic elements of uh, capital-based macro, and there's the list, and you can, you've seen them in your textbooks in various forms, at least all but one probably. Uh, the production possibilities frontier is in every principal's text in the industry. It just shows there's trade-offs between uh, doing one thing and doing another, or between producing one good and producing another. And as, as we'll see, between producing consumer goods and producing uh, investment goods or capital goods. Loanable funds market, that just means there's borrowing and lending going on out there. And uh, the give and take in that market establishes a market clearing price, which is the interest rate uh, for the loans. The structure of production is pretty uniquely Austrian. Uh, goes back to uh, Minger, uh, talking about orders of goods. You've probably heard something about that this morning and Bomba Werk and uh, is set out by Hayek in, in a graphical form that we'll make use of. And then uh, we'll see the structure of production entails a number of sequenced stages of production where the output of one stage feeds in as input to the next stage. And that each stage has its own specific labor market. We can't talk about the labor market as if it's the same across the whole economy especially when the interest rate may be changing because changes in interest rates uh, have differential effects on market rates, on market wages, depending on the particular stage. Then in application, uh, we look first at sustainable growth. That's the market at work for you and for me. And then we look at unsustainable growth. That's uh, triggered by an artificial boom. In other words, a policy-induced growth rate that by its nature can't persist. It's, it's, it's a boom, yeah, it's a boom, but it's going to end in a bust because uh, it's based on an artificially low interest rate, as uh, Steve Hankey uh, puts it. Okay, well, let's get started. Uh, I'm going to start with the production possibilities frontier and uh, show you what the frontier looks like as a, in the macro terms. I've got consumption on the vertical axis and investment. Think of investment goods. Uh, on the uh, horizontal axis. And uh, the frontier represents a trade-off. In other words, there are a certain uh, uh, amount of resources to be used, and uh, if they're used in one direction, they can't be used in, in another. So the, the frontier slopes downward. You have to give up something in order to get something. If the market is working under favorable conditions, uh, we will end up on the frontier, that would be a fully employed economy. It's on the frontier. We're producing 
so much in the way of consumption goods and so much in the way uh, of investment goods. Um, here I'm just indicating that this little piece of graphics appears in all of the textbooks, but usually just to emphasize the whole concept of scarcity. There's no such thing as free consumption, no such thing as free investment. You have to give up some of one to get more of the other. It's used sometimes in an international context, showing why post-war Japan grew more rapidly than post-war U.S. Uh, but it's rarely used in a macro context, and that's what we're doing today. So that's sort of new with the uh, Austrian theory is to put this to work in a macroeconomic uh, context where we can show an economy actually moving along the frontier as people's preferences change uh, with respect to timing of consumption. If they decide to save up more now in order to enjoy more consumption in the future, then we'd expect to see a movement along that frontier and a different mix of output consumption relative to uh, investment. Featuring this trade-off also shows you a huge contrast between the Austrian view and the Keynesian view. Because Keynes, if you've studied Keynes, what you know is that Keynes simply adds the two components, C plus I, actually C plus I plus G, throws in government spending for a mixed economy. C plus I, add them together. And that's expenditures. And then look how that compares to incomes. That's, that's the Keynesian analytics. And so this is very much uh, different than Keynes because we're, we're juxtaposing them, putting them in, in, uh, uh, on two separate axes and showing how there's one traded off uh, against the other. Okay. Uh, investment in this construction is gross investment. Uh, and uh, it includes, uh, well, this, the investment then is measured by that full uh, horizontal distance to the uh, point on the PPF, the production possibilities frontier. That's how much is being invested currently in this particular economy. Uh, now, it turns out that a lot of that is just what's called replacement capital or uh, making good on depreciation. Uh, machines are wearing out. Machines are becoming obsolete. You have to invest more just to stay even, just to replace what you're using up. Uh, so a lot of it is replacement capital, but not all of it, okay? So replacement capital may be a pretty good hunk, but some of the investment is, uh, is net investment. It's, it's adding in net terms to the total productive capacity uh, of the economy. Um, so the difference then between gross investment and replacement would be net investment. Now. What we understand here, and in fact, this is pretty straightforward use of uh, the production possibilities frontier. If we have net investment, that means that next year, our trade-off will allow us to produce more consumption and more investment. In other words, the frontier itself will shift out from year to year if each year we're increasing the productive capacity of the economy, okay? Um, the outward shifting of the PPF represents sustainable economic growth. Okay, this is investment that was undertaking more productive capacity. The economy grows, all right? It's very sustainable. And here it says, watch the economy grow. So we'll watch it grow. We didn't quite watch it grow. Let's try it again. Here we'll watch it grow. You can hear it grow, okay? <laughs> the economy grows. <laughs> Real growth. You can't doubt it, okay? There it goes. And we'll let it go out about uh, four periods and see that uh, sometime down the line we're producing more of both consumption uh, and investment, okay? Uh, so just tracked about four periods there. And here I say the actual rate of expansion depends on a number of things. We can kind of gloss over that. Depreciation is increasing too. Okay, you got more machinery to wear out. And... When people get more wealthy, if they, they're earning more income, uh, they're probably saving more, even in proportion. Uh, so those factors could be taken into account. But right here, I just want to show that uh, the frontier will shift out if you have some net investment uh, each year. Now, what's more important probably, and this is very much in contrast with Keynes, is that uh, people's preferences can change. People can decide to save more. Uh, almost have to 
introduce this apologetically because Keynes was so sure that those preferences never changed. But they do. Uh, people can decide to save for travel during retirement or save to send their kids to a better college or save to pay their way in a retirement community. I mean, people have different, way, different reasons for saving. They may decide to save more. Uh, and if they do, then what that requires is a movement along that uh, production possibilities front. People are willing to give up some current consumption in order to be able to consume more later, and those resources can now be invested uh, so the economy will grow faster and uh, there will be more to consume. Okay, and so uh, suppose people become more thrifty. It says watch the movement along the frontier. We can do that too. There it goes, okay. You can move along the frontier uh, and uh, produce more investment at the expense of con current consumption. Okay, tighten your belt, cut down a little bit, save. That's what your parents tell you, right? You need to save more. Uh, <laughs> Okay, now, guess what? The economy grows more rapidly because we're starting out now with a greater investment base uh, and the economy grows more rapidly. It says, now watch the economy grow. And here you can hear it. It's going faster. It sounds faster. It looks faster. It is faster, okay? Because you started out uh, with some saving to give it a little kick. Perfectly sustainable because you tightened your belt. You abstained from using resources that were employed instead in uh, the investment sector of the economy. We can compare uh, the economies and see that uh, thriftiness is what makes the difference. I'll put our slow growth economy over here and note that uh, the difference, uh, and that is that without the initial saving, okay, the economy grew, but at a pretty humdrum rate. But if people decide to save, uh, then you get first a reduction in consumption and then a higher rate. And by the end of uh, the fourth period, uh, you're actually consuming more than you would have been consuming had you not saved. Again, I, I hate to sound like your parents, okay? <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and the Austrians really aren't cheerleaders for economic growth. Uh, they're just pointing out some connections. That, that your decision, you decide how much to save, and that can determine the sustainable growth rate, okay? Uh, we'll see later that uh, you, where you get in trouble is uh, is not saving, but voting for politicians who promise to grow the economy. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's where you have to watch out. Okay. Now uh, I've shown you something about what could happen, what might happen, but I need to say something about how how does it happen? What what is it out there in the marketplace that's getting us that result? Uh, and the answer to that is that it's it's called the loanable funds market. It's just the borrowing and lending that's going on out there, and that's really the, the market that equilibrates resources over time. In other words, uh, the business community can borrow funds to undertake investment, produce output uh, for the future. You as savers lend funds. You put it in the bank, those get lent out. You lend funds uh, to business people to take command of the resources that are available for uh, consumption. And, and that market looks pretty uh, tame. In fact, we can get it out of Alfred Marshall if you want to. There's a supply of loans, and there's a demand for loans. The supply is your willingness to save. And the more interest people pay you, the more you're willing to save. No surprise. The demand is the business community's demand for those funds to undertake investment activities. And if the market is working here, if it's allowed to work, if Ben Bernanke isn't overriding that interest rate and giving us a, a rate chosen by the Federal Open Market Committee, then uh, it works out, okay, that the, that, uh, that market clears uh, and gives you an equilibrium. Now, look at the horizontal axis. We're, we're looking at the saving and separately investment. Saving is supply and investment uh, is demand. Uh, but what is it that's being saved and invested? Well, it turns out that that's, that same magnitude is, that's, represents the investable resources. Think of it this way. You go to work and you produce some stuff. You get paid for it. It's called income. You spend part of that income on the stuff and you save the rest. The business community borrows those funds and takes command out of what was produced but not consumed in the period. Those are the investable resources that can be used 
to increase the productive capacity of the economy. Okay. Now, it's interesting here that as much disagreement as there is between Austrians and Keynesians, that both Bohm Bavaric, that's Mr. Capital Theory, uh, both Bohm Bavaric and Keynes agreed that what was really being equilibrated here is the supply and demand for investable resources. And just once removed, because we're talking about the financial uh, wherewithal to take command of those uh, investable resources. But for our purposes, uh, that horizontal distance is, is the investable resources, okay? Now, uh, just to put this, just to anchor this in the history of economic thought, uh, the name you associate it with that uh, little piece of geometry with the supply and demand of loanable funds is Dennis Robertson. He's a British economist. He was, was a friend of Keynes. I say was because he was such a friend that he read the uh, whole manuscript of Keynes 1930 book uh, treatise on money and gave him some critical remarks and uh, in fact they were so critical that Keynes didn't let him read the manuscript for the general theory <laughs> so, but uh, he was an advocate of the loanable funds theory of interest uh, the Austrians and particularly Hayek used the loanable funds theory in their theory of the business cycle but they tended not to draw it they tended not to draw the supply and demand, but yet that's, that's the way they, they thought, okay? Uh, now, uh, a point that will come back to us in a later lecture that I give is that uh, this one diagram, supply and demand of loanable funds, is the one and only diagram that appears in Keynes' general theory. It's on page 180. There's no other diagrams in the general theory. And uh, it came from a suggestion by Roy Herod, another one of Keynes' friends. And Herod told Keynes, it looks like you're throwing out the loanable funds theory. And Keynes says, yes, that's right. That's what I'm doing. He says, well, your readers won't believe you. And if you really want to get their attention, if you really want them to believe that's what you're doing, you better make it clear. So he said, okay, I'll put it in and throw it out. And that's what he did. He, he, he displayed this one piece of graphic in his general theory and said this is what has to go okay so that uh, for the Austrian that gives us increased confidence that we probably ought to keep this this particular market okay supply and demand for loanable funds okay now again I want to suppose that people become more future oriented in other words as, as uh, Bob Murphy would have said uh, last period uh, their time preferences aren't quite as strong. They have lower time preferences. They're willing to give up more consumption now in order to be able to consume more in the future. So they cut back on consumption they save. Well, if they save, it means it shifts rightward that supply of loanable funds. They add to the supply of loanable funds. Okay. And so, so watch the saving curve shift rightward. Well, there it goes. Okay, you shift the saving curve rightward. It bids down interest rates. It uh, increases the uh, funds to be borrowed, and actually uh, those are matched by increases in investable resources. Because when you save, you didn't consume. When you didn't consume, you left more of, of the produced output available for use by uh, the investment sector. That's very sustainable. Okay. So what we see here is that saving is a prerequisite for investment. Uh, people if they save, then that frees up resources to be uh, invested. Okay. Now, uh, what you've seen so far, you've seen two little pieces of the puzzle. They fit together. They fit together. Uh, they tell two different uh, perspectives on the same story. So let's put them both up there. You've got the loanable funds market. You've got the uh, production possibilities frontier. And uh, you can see that uh, uh, they line up because of that investment axis, all right? Um, so a uh, loanable funds market just shows how the interest rate brings saving investment in line with one another. In other words, it gives you that balance that you lose, uh, according to uh, Hanke, uh, with uh, uh, credit expansion. So you have the balance now. And then uh, the PPF, production possibility front, there, shows how the trade-off is struck between consumption uh, and investment, okay? So uh, 
market adjustments in prices, wages, interest rates keep you on the frontier. Uh, and so what we're going to do now uh, is uh, assume once again that people become more thrifty and we're going to watch the economy adjust. Now what I'll ask you to do is turn your head sideways so that you can look at the upper diagram with one eye and the lower diagram with the other, but you know what to anticipate. No, the other way. No, turn the other. Okay. You know what to anticipate. I'll show it twice because you've got to look at two different things. You see, you've you got some coordination there. You've got some compatibility. You've got the loanable fund shifting rightward, creating more uh, in resources for investment. You've got uh, the interest rate lower, which uh, uh, entices investors to borrow and to commit those uh, funds to uh, investments. You've got consumption falling, which is another way of saying people are saving more. So again, that's the market at work for you and for me. Now, what we should be able to see here uh, is that it says even the possibility that the market economy could work in this way is at odds with Keynesian theory. Okay, Keynes denied that that can happen. You can't move along the production possibilities frontier. If that were really true, why would we call it a possibilities frontier? <laughs> okay, uh, but you can't move along it according to Keynes. Uh, and because you note here that investment goes up when consumption goes down. If you remember your principles macro, that never happens. That never happens. If consumption goes down, that means inventories are piling up at Walmart. That means they can't unload the junk they've already got on the shelf. Why would they want to produce more of it? Okay? So the Keynesian story is that people are saving and not spending. Uh, we've got a surplus of junk called excess inventories. Uh, cut back on orders, cut back on labor, cut back on everything. The, the economy spirals down into recession. That's the Keynesian story. Uh, and, and, and that squares with the Keynesian notion that those two magnitudes, consumption and investment, move up and down together, which is another way of saying you can't move along the frontier. Well, Hayek is here to say you can move along the frontier. And uh, this is a theory that explains uh, how. Um, here I've set out the Keynesian theory about spiraling downwards, and it even has a name. Uh, it's called Keynes's Paradox of Thrift. Okay, paradoxically, people try to save more in order to be able to consume more in the future, and it turns out that uh, it just sends the economy into depression. They have less income out of which to save. Right? More about that when we put Keynes and Hayek head to head. Okay. Now, Keynes had it partly right that if you're looking at particular kinds of investment, like maintaining retail inventories, then that kind of investment, sure enough, moves with consumer demand. If you quit stomping into Walmart buying stuff, then I'll guarantee you they'll quit uh, ordering more and more stuff to stock on their shelves. Who could doubt it? Okay, Keynes had that one right. Okay, but that's the only part of the story. We don't care about this wireless network that somebody found. Okay, uh, that's that's only part of the story. The other part of the story is the interest rate. Okay, the interest rate because a low interest rate uh, gives uh, uh, increased incentive to borrow funds and invest for the future, not for now when people aren't buying. They're saving now, but they're saving up for something. I like to call it SUFS. S U F S. They're not saving for fun. It's not fun. Okay. They're saving up for something, and any entrepreneur who has an idea of what they might be willing to buy when they've saved up their purchasing power stands to earn a profit, okay? And, and they can borrow at a low interest rate and, and uh, undertake investment activities of one sort or another. So the interest rate effect dominates in long-term or early-stage investments, okay? Not, re not in inventory uh, stocking, but in... Uh, research and development or product development or something like that. So to keep track of those changes, we need the structure of production that Hayek introduced by the 30. They found another one. Uh, we need the structure of production. So here is the structure of production. Uh, and what's going on here is, is that Hayek is disaggregating output. That's the hallmark of Austrian theory. Disaggregate down to where you can see what people are doing and how markets work, okay? 
the dis, Hayek is disaggregating output intertemporally. In other words, he's looking at stuff available today for consumption, stuff that will produce output uh, in, in a month, stuff that will produce output in six months or a year or five years or ten years, and, and look at it differentially, okay? And so the structure of production uh, is a sequence of stages that are linked to one another such that the output of one stage feeds in as input to the next. It's a story told in your textbooks about about the farmer growing, growing grain and the miller uh, making flour and the baker making bread and the grocer selling loaves of bread and so on. Well, fine, that's what happens, but the Austrians are keeping track of the temporal dimension to all that. Okay, so here's the structure of production. It's a sequence of triangles. It's called the Hayekian triangle. Um, that uh, label consumption is really the vertical intercept. It's that, it's that last the output of the final stage is a consumable output. Uh, if I actually put an axis there, I would just have to label it value of inputs and outputs, and you can see that at early stages, you have a, 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 an output that sells as input to the next stage and so on. Uh, so your stages of production, and uh, it shows how much ultimately get uh, produced uh, and available for consumption. Now, at the early stage is something like uh, product development, okay? There's a guy at work, he's developing some products, not going to be available for a long time. Whoever borrows and invests in this is going to have to carry that investment at interest for some years before he finally has something to sell, okay? At the other end, you have uh, retail inventories. Looks like he's pretty much got it knocked there. Needs some customers, but he's got it all stocked up, okay? Uh, and uh, I've shown you the contrast, the early stage and the late stage. They work differently in the market economy, precisely because of that temporal dimension that's so important in, uh, in the Austrian theory. Okay. Now, the number of stages is not an empirical finding. We didn't discover there were five stages. It's just a, for pedagogical purposes. We want to conceive of early stage or middle stage or late stage or final stage. So five tends to be a pretty good number. It says, watch the resources, or what Hayek calls goods in progress, move through the stages of production. You can think of the, uh, the farmer and the grain and the miller and the retailer. You can think of extraction industries, yanking iron ore out of the ground and banging it into steel and making automobile fenders and so on. Or you can think of simply product development uh, through uh, maintaining retail inventory. So watch it move through the stages of production. There it goes. Okay, you can watch it and see it. Now, you might think you have never seen anything quite like that before, okay? <laughs> but, but you have. But you have. You can't deny it. <laughs> okay? So I don't want you ever to see another one of those commercials without thinking of Hayek, okay? <laughs> Okay, so this sequence of stages reform, uh, form the Hayekian triangle, and a lot of times uh, we just eliminate the demarcation of the various stages and just use the whole triangle like that. Uh, in a growing economy, the triangle increases uh, in, in all dimensions. It just gets bigger, okay? Uh, and in fact, we can uh, show here, if we bring back our PPF, that output of the final stage is consumption, which is exactly the thing we've been measuring on the production possibilities frontier. And if we have a growing economy, it all grows, okay? Uh, it says watch it grow, we can, we can watch it like so. It was five, four stages, five stages, whatever it is, okay? Uh, just change size, it didn't change uh, shapes. Uh, this, this actually would, uh, have its complement in Keynes, where Keynes, in his chapter four, he talks about there being a fixed structure of industry. And here I'm just saying if somehow it is fixed, if, if people's time preferences aren't changing, uh, then it would grow with change in size and no change in shape. But uh, in Hayekian economics, in Austrian economics, it can change in shapes, okay? It can change in shapes. Uh, people choose to save more, they send two 
seemingly conflicting signals. Let's look at these two signals. We've really already talked about them. One is decreased consumption dampens the demand for investments in late stages. That's retail inventories. Uh, but secondly, reduced interest rate encourages investment, well, in early stages. See, if you think in Keynesian terms, you see that as just in conflict. Those are in conflict. Oh, one signal says invest more, the other signal says invest less. And Keynes thought, well, it's no question, the one that says invest less wins, and you get the paradox of thrift. Hayek says they're both operating, but they're operating in different stages of the structure of production. Okay? So really, they're two complementary forces. They're in conflict only if you think in terms of the simple Keynesian aggregate, C plus I plus G. And which way is I going? Is it going to go up or going to go down? Well, Hayek is there to tell you that some of it goes up and some of it goes down. It has differential effects on the structure of production. Okay? And in fact, this is a very instance that caused Hayek in criticizing Keynes to say that Keynes's aggregates conceal the most fundamental mechanisms of change. Okay? He's saying that you're lumping everything together and calling it investment and therefore failing to see the differential effects within that temporally sequenced structure of production. So you, Keynes was failing to see that, and, and uh, indeed he was. Now, again, consider increased saving. Uh, and, and we can see what's happened. You get the derived demand effect for sure. Walmart quits stocking as much if you're not buying as much. But you also get the time discount effect that entrepreneurs uh, who see a lower interest rate are willing to uh, undertake longer term investment projects uh, uh, in order to make a profit on those by selling them to you after you've done your save. When you've saved up funds, you've saved up your purchasing power, and you're ready to buy something, uh, the entrepreneur with the thing that you want to buy uh, will make a profit. Okay? Now, the theory doesn't explain just exactly how the entrepreneur decides what to make. Um, in fact, if I knew more about that, I'd probably quit teaching economics and become an entrepreneur. I never can predict those sorts of things. Okay, I would, I would, I would never thought that Cadillac pickup trucks would sell, or I, I would never have thought that hubcaps that keep spinning after you've stopped your car <laughs> would make you a fortune. You know, but we got entrepreneurs out there who figure out these things. <coughs> Okay. Again, watch the structure of production respond. Now, you know what's going to happen. Resources need to move from that late stage where people aren't consuming now so much and go to the early stage to, to gear up for more consumption later. So watch the triangle uh, change in shape. There it goes. You can see those resources slide. Let's watch that again. Okay, this. okay so resources move out of uh, the late stages and uh, into the early stages. Okay. And we can even show that with uh, the production possibilities frontier. Because they tell the same story. In other words, we're, we're moving along the frontier, consuming less, and investing more, and that more is going disproportionately into the early stages. Okay. So again, you need to watch one diagram with each eye. And you can see it tells a consistent story. Okay. Watch the economy respond to an increase in saving. There it goes. It's moving along the frontier. Uh, investment is low in the current period uh, so that we can uh, allocate more investment to the longer term stages of production. Okay. Uh, and once again, we see investment increasing. The structure has more of a future orientation. It's going to accommodate consumption demands in the more distant future. That's what saving is all about. And here, uh, now we say, watch the economy grow more rapidly. Uh, and sure enough, you can see it. Uh, and this involves not, not just a change in the size of the triangle, but it initially changed shapes. Okay? So at this point, what's fun to do is actually graph consumption vertical axis against time to see what's happening with consumption over time. And first, let's look at it with some arrows. Look up at this uh, triangle, and, and you can see that consumption first fell 
and then rose. It fell as resources went to the early stage. It rose as the triangle got bigger. Or in the production function, you can see you, you moved along the frontier with falling consumption. Then you moved out at a more rapid rate. So watch it. I'll do it twice. See, the arrow goes down. Let's see. Down in both directions and then up. Okay. Do it again. Down in both directions and, and then up. Okay. Now, if I plot that over time, here's what it looks like. There's the consumption. It was growing nonetheless. But once you save, then it was allowed to grow faster uh, because of the increase in the productive capacity of the economy. Uh, it says consumption rises more rapidly than before, and there's three dots, eventually exceeding what it would have been had you not saved. In fact, if you extrapolate that, uh, extrapolate that consumption, you see that at some point uh, you're consuming more than you would have been able to consume had you not initially saved. There's a, and here's the trade-off in, in one more form. Saving implies giving up some consumption in the near future. We can cross-hatch that to see what's given up. And what do you get in return? Well, you get more consumption in the more distant future. Okay, that's the trade-off. And if people choose to make that trade-off, they do it by saving. It sets the uh, mechanism, the market in motion that adjusts the productive capacity to give you that uh, result. See, this is all part of uh, how the economy works. And only have to add one more element here, stage-specific labor markets. Uh, and in doing that, all I'm doing really is replacing the pictures of the person in product development and the picture of the retail clerk uh, with supply and demand diagrams. In other words, that's labor in the different stages. And you know what's going to happen, that, that uh, the way that resources are shifted out of late stages into early stages is by a decrease in demand for labor in the late stage and an increase in the demand for labor in the early stage. Okay, Walmart doesn't hire as many clerks. Product developers hire more workers. Okay. Uh, so, again, we're looking at the increase in saving. Watch the economy respond to an increase in saving. You know what to anticipate. That those resources, yeah, they shift to the early stages. And the reason they do is because demand for labor increases in those stages while it decreases in the, early, in the late stages. Watch it work. See how demand fell in the late stages. People aren't working at Walmart so much. It uh, increased in the early stages, more product development. Uh, in, in developing this part of the diagram, I could link it up with a, sort of an otherwise mysterious diagram in prices and production, where Hayek referred to a, what he called a wage rate gradient. And you can see the gradient here. I can mark it uh, on those uh, lower diagrams that the, that the wage rate is, is the lowest at the final stage, the highest at the, most, at the earliest stage, and everywhere in between is along that uh, gradient. That gradient persists until the structure adapts itself to the, the new intertemporal preferences, the new saving uh, preferences. Okay. Now look what we've got so far. This is just a little summary diagram. There's the uh, Loanable funds, there's production possibilities frontier, the triangle, the stage specific labor. You got it all working at once for you, okay? Now you're going to have to, you need four eyes to watch all this, okay? Watch the economy respond to an increase in saving. I'll do it a couple of times, but you know what you're going to see, okay? More saving, lower interest, move along the frontier, shift resources to the early stages, which is accomplished by differential changes in demand for labor in those labor markets. Watch it go. Okay, we'll do it one more time here. Okay. Now, that's what Hayek meant when he says you first have to understand how things could go right before you can even ask how they could go wrong. And once you've figured out this much, then it's a corollary to show that things will go wrong if the interest rate is distorted from what it needs to be. 
Okay, and and so this part of the lecture, which actually is uh, is the basis for this whole lecture, is pretty easy to go through. Applications of capital-based macro, sustainable growth supported by saving. That's what you've just seen. Uh, and now unsustainable growth credit, uh, triggered by credit expansion. So what you need to be thinking now is suppose that you don't save more at all. Thank you very much. You don't like to save. It's not fun. You'll go ahead consuming. Okay. But you want higher growth, so you vote for politicians who promise to grow the economy. How are they going to do that? Well, they need to get interest rates down. Who can do that? Name's Ben Bernanke. Okay. Flood credit markets with new money, depress interest rates, and get something going here. All right. Uh, now, what do they get going? Do they get genuine growth going? No, they get artificial growth going. They get a boom that comes to no good end. And watch it this way. So, new money masquerades as saving, okay? So, the supply of loanable funds shifts to the right, but without there being any increase in saving. In other words, you just add to the current supply of loanable funds some money uh, created for the purpose, okay? So watch the opposing movements in saving and investment. This is what uh, Hanke's talking about, opposing movements. Saving actually goes down as investment goes up. Uh, when you pump money into the economy. Okay, there it goes, money going into the economy. And what you see is that uh, you send investors down along the demand for investment funds. In other words, they can borrow cheap and they'll borrow. But you send savers down the saving schedule. If they can't get any more than that for their savings, why not go ahead and consume now? Okay? So consume, consumption actually goes up uh, while, uh, say, while investment goes up uh, as well. So essentially we drive a wedge here. Let me get to that part. The result is unsustainable. So You've got investors moving along the demand for loanable funds market uh, and savers moving along the supply curve. Now, you might think that, therefore, you have a shortage of credit. But, who, but how does that shortage get papered over, almost in a literal sense? It's Bernanke creating more money. In other words, the difference is masked temporarily by an increase in the money supply. Okay, so, so when you pump new money into the economy, you, you cover up the difference between uh, saving and investment. That doesn't exactly fix the problem. It postpones the problem and makes the problem fester. All right? And it'll fester all during the boom, and then you get the bust. Okay? That's the way it works. Okay? Again, much of Hayek's writings causes you to visualize that particular diagram, but he doesn't draw it himself. If we trace up to that uh, production possibilities frontier, what we see is that uh, consumers would like to, I'm sorry, investors want to invest more, and consumers want to consume more. So you get a double disequilibrium. You've got a tug of war going on. You drove a wedge between saving and investment. Now you've got a tug of war uh, going on between consumers and investors. Uh, but uh, consumption here is measured vertically, and investment is measured horizontally. So essentially, they're trying to push out beyond the frontier, which they can do, but only temporarily, because the frontier itself is defined in terms of sustainable growth, sustainable combinations of an investment and consumption. And so if you do the resolution of those two diagrams, you get to what I call uh, a virtual point out there, Kind of looks eerie. It's a virtual point out there. Uh, and it's a point that, uh, that the economy is trying to get to, but it can't get there. It can get part of the way. It can go above the frontier, but only on a temporary basis. In other words, you have an overheated economy, a booming economy, but driven by credit expansion. Um, so here I'm just explaining. There's some scope for movement beyond the PPF the unemployment rate will be down below what's normally considered full employment. It might be down uh, to 4% or even below 4%. Any, anything below 5% is pretty much an overheated uh, economy. 
uh, or capital goods can be uh, worked without stopping for maintenance. Okay, there's ways to the ways to, to make hay while the sun shines, or make hay make hay while Bernanke prints money. I guess uh, to get beyond the frontier. Look at it in terms of the stages of, of production. Uh, you get two opposite signals. You get uh, increased investment, but projects that can't ultimately be finished because they're not supported by saving. You get increased consumption. People want to consume but rather than save at a puny interest rate. Uh, and so those two triangles are in conflict with one another. John Cochran at uh, Metropolitan State in Colorado calls this dueling triangles. I like his uh, imagery. Okay. So here we can identify the different concepts in uh, Austrian economics. We get overinvestment, uh, but more importantly, malinvestment. In other words, we're, we're committing, over committing resources to stages too early uh, based on the artificially low interest rate. Okay, you get overconsumption. Mises used the phrase malinvestment and overconsumption uh, repeatedly. And I'll show that in the triangle, too. I'm not going to say malconsumption. It sounds like malnutrition or something. I'll call it overconsumption. Okay. There's Mises' phrase, malinvestment and overconsumption. So the tug of war shows up as these uh, competing uh, triangles. So what we see is the economy pushes out beyond the frontier. It has an investment bias because of that low interest rate. The investors get the money first. You'll hear that in the Austrian story. Uh, eventually, it's unsustainable, and you get a downturn and possibly even a caving into a deep uh, depression. Um, yeah, here's, a, here's something that's worth looking at. So what I'm showing here is the economy, it's a there's a bubble, okay, that bubbles up above the uh, PPF. And, and then crashes. And uh, sometimes I don't like to hear the question, where are we in the cycle now? Because I, I'm not always sure about just how to answer it. Uh, but here I can, because look at that bubbling up of the economy uh, and, and as it comes back to the PPF, and compare it with the unemployment rate. Here I'm measuring unemployment starting from back in 91 to uh, 2008. And this most recent period with the housing uh, disaster, uh, it shows the unemployment uh, dropping down in the unsustainable range, in other words, an overheated economy, and then returning uh, back to 5.5%, uh, which is dead center in the full employment range. Okay, so the, the orange bubble on the PPF perfectly mirrors uh, the unemployment bubble showing the overheated uh, economy. Uh, so the, the, the Austrians and the Hayekians have a perfect explanation of what's going on here. The mainstream economists are befuddled because they think only in terms of the trade-off between inflation and unemployment. And unemployment is in the middle of the full employment range. And inflation is still in the low single digits. So it seems like there's no problem at all. And if you try to fix one, you make the other one worse anyhow. So if there's no problem, you, what do you say? Well, we know what you say. You say this, we have a nation of whiners, I think is the, is the right term. Okay. That's what he's thinking. You know, this, uh, Phil Graham thinks in very conventional terms. You know, what, are you, what are you complaining about? We've got full employment, we've got low inflation. What are you whining about? Okay. And of course, what you're whining, you know, there's plenty to whine about because uh, the interest rate has been uh, distorted. Um, yeah, okay, I see. Uh, so once again, I put this together and I show you that we can even identify the phases of the cycle. There's the boom, okay, and there's the bust, and uh, the whole theory is a theory of this, this, the unsustainable boom. It shows you how the boom turns into a bust. Uh, and then what we have is what Hayek called a secondary contraction, meaning that things can really get out of hand especially if the government does some really dumb things, okay? 
like sending out rebate checks uh, in a period that was characterized by overconsumption. <laughs> We've had overconsumption. Well, we'll fix that. We'll send you more money. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and so the secondary contraction in the Deep Depression depends pretty clearly on what sorts of policies the government pursues in the face of a bust. And uh, typically, uh, as Roosevelt and Hoover before him did, and as generally gets done, they do the wrong things. We'll talk more about that when we talk about the Great Depression. Okay. Uh, I've just got a couple minutes left, but uh, I hate, to, I usually don't use it, uh, the three P's or something like that sound like a management course or worse, you know. So, But here, padding the supply with loanable funds with new money drives a wedge between saving and investment. Papering over the difference between saving and investment gives play to the tug of war between consumers and investors. Pitting early stage against late stage disturb, uh, distorts the Hayek in triangle in both directions. The temporal discoordination eventually turning boom into bust. That's the story, okay? Uh oh, watch the economy respond to a credit contraction. You're going to have to look hard at this one, okay? <laughs> now let's let's just get the contrast I mean sustainable growth versus unsustainable growth if you grow on the basis of people's savings uh, it's sustainable it's genuine you get a healthy economy you get growth that's the whole story okay uh, and and once more if it's credit expansion all hell breaks loose and you get that Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>